Welcome once again. <clears throat> My name is Cyril Brightman. I'm the uh, director of the English Language Desk of Yad Vashem's International Relations Division. Um, we're very pleased today to uh, be joined by Dr. Robert Rosette as our guest lecturer. Uh, Dr. Rosette is currently the senior, a senior historian in Yad Vashem's International Institute for Holocaust Research. Prior to this, for 25 years, beginning late in 1992, he was the director of Yad Vashem's libraries, and he's been at Yad Vashem since 1981 in various capacities. Dr. Rosette was born in Summit, New Jersey in 1956 and grew up in neighboring New Providence. He obtained his BA from Rutgers a College, Rutgers University in 1978. Um, and he received his MA in 1981, as well as his PhD in 1987 from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he studied with Professor Yehuda Bauer. His dissertation was about Jewish rescue and revolt in Slovakia and Hungary. Dr. Rosette has authored and edited scholarly books and articles, as well as pieces for the popular press, primarily about the Holocaust in Hungary, the period of, liber of liberation, distortion of the Holocaust, and the historiography of the Holocaust. Among his scholarly publications are conscripted slaves, Hungarian Jewish forced laborers, laborers on the Eastern Front during the Second World War, which was published by Yad Vashem in 2013. And uh, the book was a runner up for the US National Jewish Book Award for 2014 in the category of Holocaust research. His most recent book is entitled After So Much Pain and Anguish, First Letters After Liberation, which he edited with Dr. Yael Nidam Orvieto, once again at Yad Vashem 2016. Dr. Rosette has guided many dignitaries through Yad Vashem over the years and has lectured widely around the world. He serves as the, as the historical advisor to the Echoes and Reflections Educational Program and is a member of Israel's delegation to IRA. He made Aliyah in 1978, is married to Shoshi, and they have four grown children and are proud grandparents. Um, over to you, Dr. Rosette. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you very much. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you are. So why didn't they leave? It's one of the questions people ask the most when they look at the period of the Holocaust and want to understand why didn't Jews manage to get out? Why didn't they leave? What I'd really rephrase the question a little differently, I'd say, why didn't more Jews flee? Because there were Jews that left, lots and lots of them, hundreds and thousands of them that managed to flee. Out of a population of 520,000 Jews in Germany, 300,000 managed to flee by October 1941, when then it became absolutely impossible. Out of about 180,000 Jews in Austria, 125,000 managed to flee until that same date. After the war began, 300,000 Jews roughly fled from Poland eastward into the Soviet territory. That's about 10% of the Jewish population of Poland. And of course, many thousands of other Jews during the Holocaust years tried to flee, tried to flee from the areas in which they were being persecuted that were under the Nazis domination or under the allies who were working with the Nazis, the, their various Axis partners. So there's a lot of flight. So really the question when you ask it might, isn't why didn't they leave, but why didn't more flee? And to do that, we have to try to understand something about the situation. So, the first thing we have to think about is periodization. I know the Holocaust period starts in 1933, of course, when the Nazis come into power, and certainly continues until the end of the war in 1945. And we can talk also about the displaced person camps afterwards that existed until the early 1950s. But for the issue of flight, of course, we're talking until the end of the war. So it's a 12 year period that we're talking about. And of course, it's not all the same. And the first thing you have to understand or ask yourself is, so what was happening and what were Jews fleeing from when? And I think that's one of the most important questions we even ask about it, to understand the stages. So I'm sure many of you know this material, but just to go through it quickly so that we're all thinking in the, along the same categories. The Nazis came into power in 1933 and through 1937, they were mostly issuing all kinds of decrees that limited the place of Jews in the society that were, that were isolating them in the society in terms of work and where they could be and Jews being able to perform in the arts and other various things being restricted. And 
there was violence in this period, but it's more street violence than any kind of organized and orchestrated violence, but there's plenty of street violence in this period of 1933 to 37. And there's violence in situations that we don't always think about perhaps, for example, for children in the classroom because children could continue studying in regular schools up until around 1938. And so often the school ground and the classroom were, were places where there was violence against children. So there's violence going on, but there's certainly no policy of a systematic mass murder. And it's not something the Nazis are yet discussing or thinking about or planning in any way. And most of the persecution is happening, what we could say is above the table. I mean, people see it, it's going on in open view and people know that it's happening. So that's the first period. So when Jews are fleeing in that period, they're, they're fleeing from the restrictions and from the, the random violence, you could say that's going on around them. And they're, and they're fleeing because they don't have a future and, and many reasons of that nature, but they're not yet fleeing because they're in a situation where they're in danger of their lives. And that's not gonna happen for a while still. But of course, in 1938, there's, there's an important change and that's symbolized by a number of things that happened. The German entry into Austria in, uh, in March of 38. Then of course, the, um, the uh, agreement that allowed the Germans to take over a piece of Czechoslovakia called the Munich Accords in September of 38. And then the Night of the Broken Glass, the riot against the Jews of, of Greater Germany of November of 1938. And that riot is very significant in that it is a change because now it's not just that the Jews are suffering from the persecution and the decrees and some violence here and there. This was an orchestrated violent act against the Jews. Now it's not machine-like and it's got a lot of things going on in it. And I wouldn't say that it's orchestrated in the sense that the conductor's you know, conducting an orchestra and everybody's doing their part, but it is something that comes from the center and that is and is and is and is happening because there is there are there are orders being given from the center about this event. So it's a new thing, and we can start talking about Jews now. If in the first phase, mostly wanted to leave Germany because the Nazi regime is trying to show them they have no future there. Now we're talking about much more coerced leaving. It already starts a little early, as the photograph here in the very beginning uh, shows you, because this is a photograph of Jews leaving Austria. In, in 1939. And could I have the next slide? Is it okay? Yeah. So Jews are leaving. And this is a pamphlet that was published in 1936 that shows Jews leaving. And, and it also is about Jews leaving to Australia, right? Because Jews are going wherever they can go. And this one is about going to Australia and helping them for Jews immigrating to Australia. So anyway, 1938, we have this new violence coming in. And of course, September 1st, 1939, the, the Germans will then invade Poland. And that's for many people, the start of World War II. And so by 1939 into 1941, we have a situation where the Germans are now sitting in Poland and then they'll be gathering up more territory in Western Europe in 1940. And their solutions about what to do with the Jews are not yet about murder. That's not what they're doing, but they're isolating Jews now physically with the creation of ghettos in Poland starting in autumn 1939 and much more into 1940 and into 41 even. And then ideas that come up about putting all the Jews near the town of Lublin in a reservation, which proves not to be workable or sending all the Jews to the island of Madagascar, which the Nazis will gain control of after France falls in 1940 in June of 1940. Also in the end, that's not workable, but that's what they're working towards. So Jews still even in this period when we're talking about flight, it's against a lot more violence. Because one of the things that happens in Poland in those first months is we do have the beginning of large scale killing. Not again, what we would call the systematic mass murder, what we call the final solution. But when German troops enter Poland in uh, 1939, along with them are special units of the SS called the Einsatzgruppen, which will later become the spearheads of really systematic murder later on. But they're already, putting down any civilians they think are a problem. They're, they're killing many Polish intellectuals and priests and others, and a lot of Jews as well. Um, it seems that by the end of 1939, they've probably killed around 9,000 Jews and maybe 60,000 people all told. So this is happening. So now we're talking about spatially isolating Jews in this period, and there is killing, but still not yet 
the systematic mass murder we call the final solution. That will only come with the invasion of the Soviet Union in June 22nd, 1941. And that's when we'll have the use of this tool of systematic mass murder, first of Jewish men, then after several weeks of women and children as well, as well including the Nazi political, uh, uh, Soviet political officers and some of the Sinti Roma, but it's mostly almost all Jews that are being murdered. And then sometime, nobody can tell you when, this spreads and becomes a policy, maybe in the autumn of 41, maybe only in 1942, it really coalesces into what we call the final solution, the policy of the systematic mass murder of the Jews. So by summer 41, in many places, Jews are now responding to murder. And by early 42, that's really what the Nazis are doing. Although again, in some places that's not known. They don't know if you're sitting in France in early 42, you don't know about the murder that's going on in the East yet. That's gonna take a while for those, that information to filter through. Okay, so we need to understand that, that, that periodization when we ask the question, why didn't they flee? Because then what are they fleeing from and when? So let's start with the earlier period. Now in the 1930s, 1933, until the outbreak of the war, there are countries of refuge that we think of as the traditional countries of refuge for people, for immigrants leaving. The biggest one, of course, is the United States in this period. The UK to a smaller extent, but still the UK has had people coming in as well. Both of those countries in the 1930s are already severely restricting their immigration. If I could have the next slide, please. In the United States, there has been restrictions of immigration already going on for a long time. In the, 19, in the 1880s, there was a fear that, that the United States was going to be flooded by people from the Orient, from China, and they called it the Yellow Peril. And in the 1880s, you can see Uncle Sam booting somebody in a very stereotypical you know, kind of picture of, of somebody coming out of China and booting them out. The great waves of immigration in the United States from 1880 until the end of World War I, basically, were mostly Jews from Southeastern Europe, uh, mostly people from Southeastern Europe and a lot of Jews, right? Uh, I've, the number is something like 2 million Jews that come into the United States in that period, if I remember, remember it correctly. So there is a reaction to this after World War I, and we have immigration acts of 1921 and 1924 that begin setting quotas by origin of country before this big wave of immigration in order to keep out those elements, particularly Jewish elements, and to, 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 to foster immigration of people from Northern and Western Europe much more, which is, you know, for these people seen as more desirable. So this is already going on, you know, before the Nazis come into power. There's even a stronger public discourse in the United States, um, you know, with the Great Depression of 1929 and this perception that immigrants that come in, they steal jobs and they make unemployment worse. And also in this period, there's a lot of anti-Semitism. It's common and it can be vulgar. It's not, it's not physically murderous in the way the Nazis are going to be. There's anti-Semitism of all kinds of shades in the United States in the 20s and 30s. There's plenty of it, everything from the boardroom anti-Semitism through again, anti-Semitism you can see in the streets, the, the, long, the, the range of it in many ways. So because of this very strong um, view about immigrants in general during the depression, they don't want immigrants. And then this view about Jewish immigrants in particular, um, by the time the Nazis come into power, the United States is interpreting even its, its quotas of immigration for Jews coming in, into the United States as strictly as it can. And there's a little codicil that they could use and that they did use very much where somebody could be re rejected um, a visa to United States if they were likely to become a public charge, meaning that you know they weren't going to be able to make a living. And although a potential immigrant could get affidavits about how much money they might have, or people, close relatives in the states who would support them, this was interpreted in the strictest way to keep people out to a very large extent. And so the quotas for the Germany, Austria, and then the part of Czechoslovakia were, were never really filled until until uh, the time of, uh, of the Night of the Broken Glass, around that time, 1938, that began to be filled finally in the last uh, two years, year and a half or so before the war. Um, I think that uh, Peter Wyden 
says this very well um, in a quote in Marion Kaplan's book about the Jews of Germany. And he says this, our future came to depend on three new guideposts, the quota, the total number of German refugees permitted to enter the United States under miserly immigration laws, the affidavit, the document from an obscure umpteenth cousin guaranteeing that he would support us if we became destitute, and the visa, our stamped admission ticket into the promised land. In Britain as well in this period, again, there's very strong uh, quotas. It's a little different from the United States. They don't have the same kind of a system. Maybe quotas isn't the right way to say it, but they've added laws that restrict people coming into Britain already beginning in around 1905 and then continuing even more so after World War I. And this too is in response to the large wave of Jews that have been arriving after 1980. And so they restrict immigration for them as well. Um, so they pass an Aliens Act in 1905, which is supposed to protect Britain from undesirable immigration and encouraging good immigration. If I could have the slide, please. And so here's a demonstration order in 1902 about the need, the public is feeling apparently to, to, uh, to limit immigration into Great Britain. Um, and so during World War I, there's tremendous Germanophobia. Could I have the next slide? Uh, in Great Britain as well, tremendous fear of the Germans and the hatred of the Germans. And here you can see one of these kinds of posters that you would see destroy the mad brute and list, right? It's an enlistment poster, but see how they're, they're painting the Germans. And so Jews of German origins are seen as Germans, not as Jews by a great many people. And so this is another thing adding to this environment after World War I about restricting immigrants. And of course, Jewish immigrants as time is going to go on under the Nazis. So this legislation was tightened even further in 1930s, and then again in 1938, when it really made it hard for anybody coming into Britain. And, um, and so again, it became very, very difficult as the time was going on, as there's more and more need to flee. Still, from 1933 until 1937, 33,000 German Jews did manage to come into Britain. That's not because Britain's opening its doors so much. I mean, many more probably would have come had it been available but it's not an insignificant number that does manage to come in. They're supported by the Jewish um, organizations that are set up in Britain to support them coming in. So we do have that. Another place you would think of as refuge, of course, from 1933 onwards would be mandatory Palestine. Of course, it makes sense. Uh, this, is, this is supposed to be the Jewish national home in, in being. It's supposed to come into being. But of course, we know that the British who had um, first issued the Balfour Declaration about setting up a Jewish Commonwealth or a Jewish national home in, in Palestine, were retreating from this by the 1930s. And it was harder and harder by that time to come in to Palestine. You needed something called a capitalist certificate, for example, which showed that, um, that you had enough money. There was a few other ways you could get these certificates of Aliyah, as they were called. And there was a tremendous problems, of course. People, Jewish people in Germany, or Austria often had money, but of course the Nazis took it away from them. They blocked their accounts and they took away their businesses as time went on. And so they couldn't just leave with their money. One of the things that grew out of this in 1933 was something called a transfer agreement, which is at the time it was coming to being, it was already controversial. It was an idea that um, the Jews in mandatory Palestine, the leadership, would buy agricultural implements and other machinery from Nazi Germany who wanted to export those things. It would be paid for in Germany from the blocked accounts of Jews who were trying to leave. The Jews then would be reimbursed in Palestine with enough money so they could become capitalists as they were called and have a certificate of, of immigration into Palestine in that period. Now it was controversial for obvious reasons because it had to do with coordinating this with Nazi Germany, right? So it was quite controversial at the time, but it was something that came into being and it was a way to get people out and it managed to get people out. And then if I can have another slide, the next slide, there were also new initiatives like from 1934 onward, the Youth Aliyah movement, which was set up by Recha Freier in Germany and then taken over in mandatory Palestine under Henrietta Sol. But the idea was to bring out Jewish youth from Germany, to bring them to, to Palestine to learn to work the land, to have trades. Um, and Aliyah began, Youth Aliyah. And so this was a new initiative as well. In 1939, 
infamously, the British um, adopted something called the White Paper of 1939, which restricted immigration to, to Palestine to 75,000 adults and 25,000 children over 10 years. And so it made it so much harder for Jews then to flee from Germany and Austria, and then again, eventually the, the, the Czech protectorate, it's called Bohemia Moravia, very, very hard to flee from these places to Palestine. There was very little opportunity to, to come there relatively. After the night of the broken glass, the Jews sitting in the Jewish leadership in Palestine asked the British to let 10,000 children into Palestine. The British did not agree to that, but they ended up doing something else and that they allowed 10,000 children to come into, into Great Britain itself. Again, there's other reasons. This is one of the reasons we have what we call the kinder transports. And so can I have the next slide, please? So the kinder transports, the bringing of young children without their parents into the UK is something that starts after the night of the broken glass in 1938, really into 1939, and will really occur early into the 19, as late as 1941. And you can just imagine what a difficult decision it is for people, German parents, to separate from their children and send them to, to Great Britain because they can't go. And Ruth Kluger is also quoted in Kaplan's very excellent book about German Jews in this period. And she talks about how, her, how what was going on with her and her mother about separation, in this case, not for, for Britain, but for Palestine. And she says this, my heart pounded for I would have loved to leave it, even if I had been a, been a betrayal of her. But she didn't ask me or even look at me once. Rather, she said, no one does not separate a child from her mother. On the way home, I struggled with my disappointment, which I could not express to her without hurting her. I believe I never forgave her for this. So in this case, Yuthalia, Ruth Kluger wanted to go. Her mother just could not live with the idea of separating herself from her daughter. And of course, any parent among us or grandparent certainly understands how difficult that can be. Um, from September 1st, 1939 in the UK, Jews from Germany and Austria were seen as enemy aliens. And so it became much harder, first of all, to get in, but then even more than that, once you were in the way you were treated. And so again, Jews could leave until October of 1941, but uh, getting to Britain was much harder. Getting to the United States was theoretically still possible. Um, and there were other places they were fleeing to like Shanghai or Curacao where you didn't need visas. And between 1938 and 1941, about 124,000 Jews left Germany, adding those that are left before that of the broken glass to get to roughly 300,000. Um, so there's a lot of people that were fleeing in this period. Um, and again, many of them trying to come to Britain, the United States, but it was very, very, very difficult. And then another thing that I think some of you know about, those who are listening from Australia, I'm sure know a lot about this story, and that's that German Jews in, in Great Britain were interned, many of them because they were seen as enemy aliens. And some of them were sent to farther parts in, in Great Britain itself. And some of them were sent overseas to Canada. And some of them were sent to Australia. And one of the most infamous stories about that is the Dunera ship. Could I have the next slide, please? Which of course was filled with some 2000 Jewish refugees between the ages of 16 and 60. There were also about 200 Italian fascists and 250 Nazis who were prisoners of war who were being sent to Australia, again, to move them away. These are dangerous human beings. And we know the story of the Dunera when it, as it was um, sailing, how difficult the conditions were on board and upon landing and how much people really, the Jewish refugees suffered so much on the ship, finally coming to Australia and eventually being able to live, but uh, <clears throat> going through a very, very difficult story. Lastly, before the war, there are other uh, European countries that are accepting Jews, and there have various degrees of open and closed borders. Um, none of them, I would say, are opening their borders and their doors happily to, to accept the refugees, but in some places you can get in better than in others, or at least at certain times a little bit better. So one of the important things that happens, of course, about refugees is the Evian Conference in the summer of 1938 which Franklin Roosevelt called, because there's a lot of press in the United States from Jewish organizations and other humanitarian groups to try and help these refugees. But 
America has its quota system and Roosevelt's not about to change it or doesn't feel that he can change it. He's a very political person, obviously. On the one hand, he wants to relieve some of the pressure and he calls the Evian Conference, which will meet in France, where many nations will come together to discuss the refugee issue. And basically, if we had to sum it up in just a few words, we're saying that most of the countries went there hoping that another country would solve the refugee problem. And most of them talked about how, how important it was to help, but that they couldn't really do it. The book that was written about Canadian refugee policy later on was called None is Too Many, which really is very apt for the way that Canadians were seeing things that really didn't want to open up their doors to these Jewish refugees in general. They wanted refugees who thought could act, could work in agriculture in you know, the Midwestern provinces of, of, uh, of Canada. They thought Jews to be urban and not suited to that. And so they weren't all that interested. And of course, we have the famous uh, words of the Australian representative to Evian T.W. White, who said, and I'll quote, it will no doubt be appreciated also that we have no real racial problem we're not desirous of importing one by encouraging any schemes of large scale foreign migration. I hope that the conference will find a solution to this tragic world problem. So of course he's saying, let's solve the problem, but let's not solve it in Australia. Somebody else needs to solve it. We don't want to import problems. And this is again, seeing Jews as a race, this is a racial problem. And that's very much the attitude. Now I have to be said one thing important about it beyond and that's that there was a committee set up called the Inter Intergovernmental Committee for Refugees under a very um, dynamic person by the name of George Rubley. And George Rubley had very little backing really internationally and very little money, but he worked really hard to try to organize some sort of ways to get the Jews again, this is before the war, so out of greater Germany to get them out. And he was actually quite near with a solution of getting a lot of people out. And then the war broke out in September 1st, 1939 and everything just collapsed that he'd been working on. So the Evian Conference in the end didn't achieve much. There is a certain asterisk you have to put next to it that there was an attempt and there was somebody who tried very hard to do it, but without a lot of success ultimately. As I'm saying, some countries did open their doors for periods. For example, right after the Night of the Broken Glass, Kristallnacht, for a short, short few weeks, the Netherlands opened its border more to German Jewish refugees, and so many came in. But then it closed it again, and that's sort of what was happening. Again, nothing's really open. So that's the first thing when we talk about flight in the interwar period uh, uh, that's that, where are you going to go? It's so hard to go. There's not a lot of opportunities, and there's a lot of people that want to flee with limited opportunities. So if you remember the slide that opened up the presentation, you saw people standing in line. Um, trying to get visas and all the paperwork they needed to leave Austria after 1938. So what I want to talk about now is not just that it's hard in the sense of attitudes, but it's also the bureaucracy around leaving. If the Germans are blocking the Jews' accounts, that's one important impediment to leaving that makes things hard because, of course, anybody who's immigrating wants to have some money. They have to, they're coming to a new place. You have to get started. That takes money, as everybody can imagine, and they're blocking their accounts. So that's making things very, very difficult. Sometimes German Jews were rather creative, especially early on when they were a little more possible of trying to transfer out money in whatever ways they could. But again, once the Nazis were really blocking the accounts very soon after they came in, it became very, very hard. But it's not just that. Again, you need to have all kinds of papers. So anyway, we have Jews. What do you have to leave? So this is something, again, that the list of things you needed to get into the United States, just to listen to the list. It's a long list. You need a visa application of five copies. You need a birth certificate in two copies because quotas were assigned by country of birth, not by residence. The quota number must have been reached, okay, and this established the person's place in a waiting list. It was already reached. It was always already reached, right? So you're always on a waiting list once you submit it. You need a certificate of good conduct from the German police authorities, including two copies, respectively, of the following. Your police dossier, your prison record, your military records, and other government records about the individuals. So think about it. You and you're a Jewish person in Austria or Germany, and you have to go to the police and the other authorities to get these pieces of paper, which they're not all that interested in giving you or treating you well or anything else. I mean, it's not so easy. And you have to get a good conduct 
certificate after 1940 from the German authorities. So a Jew has to prove that they haven't done anything wrong. I and mean, what's doing something wrong in Germany? I mean, people were sent into concentration camps already for the first time. They're being sent to the Jews in the summer of 1938 uh, because they had parking violations or because some other minor something, right? They were being put in concentration camps for that. So you had to have a certificate of good conduct, right? That's not easy. Then you also had to have proof that you would pass the physical examination at the US consulate if you're trying to go. And then you had to have proof of permission to leave Germany as of September 1939. They had to, you had, the Germans had to say, you can leave. Then you had to have proof that you had had the prospective immigrant had booked passage to the Western Hemisphere. Again, after 39, you needed this. Two sponsors, they were called affiants. Close relatives of the prospective immigrants were preferred. The sponsors must have been American citizens or have had permanent resident status. They must have filled out an affidavit of support and sponsorship and six notarized copies. And they also had to provide a certified copy of their most recent federal tax return, an affidavit from a bank record regarding their accounts, an affidavit from another responsible person regarding other assets, like your employer or somebody else, your commercial rating. So you had to get all of these things before you could leave. And of course you got one and some of them were dated, timed like visas and things. And so whatever, they, to be able to leave, you get one and the other one expires or you can't get one of them somehow. Like you can't get the affidavit of good behavior from the police. You're stuck, you're stuck. So again, in Marin Kaplan's book about the German Jews in this period, she quotes a woman named Elizabeth Freund. And this is Elizabeth Freund's take on all of this bureaucracy. She says, it's really enough to drive one to despair. We have filed applications for entry permits to Switzerland, Denmark, and Sweden in vain. Though in all these countries, we have good connections. In the spring of 1939, we obtained an entry permit for Mexico for 3,000 marks. But we never received the visa because the Mexican consulate asked us to present passports that, were, that would entitle us to return to Germany. And the German authorities did not issue such passports to Jews. Then in August 1939, we did actually get the permit for England, but it came only 10 days before the outbreak of the war. And this short time, we were not able to take care of the formalities. In the spring of 1940, we received the entry permit for Portugal. We immediately got everything ready and applied for our passports. Then came the invasion of Holland, Belgium, and France. A stream of refugees poured into Portugal, and the Portuguese government recalled all of the issued permits. It was also good that in December 1940, we had not paid for our Panamanian visas, for we noticed that the visa offered us did not entitle us to land in Panama. So can you imagine this Via Dolorosa of trying to get out, yet still people left. Hundreds of thousands of people left Europe. Despite all of this, they managed to leave. Now, when the war breaks out in Poland, there's gonna be a brand new situation, right? Because now there's a war going on in Europe. So again, you're an enemy alien if you're German living, trying to go to Britain, for example, but just the fact of war is going to make it so much harder to traverse borders once the war has begun. So again, if I could have the next slide. In the autumn, of, no, the one before, Morris Vistagard, that's it. So in the autumn of 1939, Morris Visegrad, who later wrote his memoirs, was in Warsaw. And he writes in his memoirs about the discussion of his family about fleeing and not fleeing. And it's a discussion about the interplay of information, what they have, what they know, their analysis of it and their options. And again, to flee or not to flee. And this is what he writes. People advise us to leave too, but we never did. We had no money. We had no place to go no one in any villages to run to. In addition, although my father was influenced by socialist ideas, he did not altogether trust the Soviet Union. The memory of Russian pogroms was too strong. Finally, although people tried to convince me to run away with them, I would not leave my parents. And they did not believe things would get so bad that we should run away. They trusted their memories of the way Germans had behaved during World War I. Back then, the Germans were considered a better occupier than the Tsar, who was no hero to the Jews. So all things considered, my father believed that in the worst case, we would get ration cards and have to do forced labor. So a family discussion, what do we do? 
a young man's discussion or a teenager. What do I do? How do I go? And this is Morris Vishagard much later on showing his family portrait many years later. So again, the family knew that the situation in Warsaw would not be good, but they'd know how, they had no idea what it would actually become. Forced labor, rationing, because that makes sense. They'd been through other wars. That could happen. Nobody had the foggiest notion of what was coming next. Nevertheless, again, 350,000, over 300,000 Jews fled Poland. Again, fleeing eastward to the Soviet territories. Many of them ended up in the Baltic countries, Lithuania, Latvia, a little less in Estonia, where they were then overtaken in the summer of 1941 when the Germans invaded those areas with their allies, right? And so earlier, some of them fled and some of them managed to integrate semi-legally, whatever. Others were arrested by the Soviets, especially those who had been political activists of some sort. Many ended up being sent to the gulags. And the gulags, of course, is a double-edged sword for somebody who gets there because some survive this and some don't, right? Because the gulags are not set up like the Nazi camps later on will be set up to murder people. They're set up to get work out of people, but they treat people brutally. And if you can't work the way you're supposed to, you don't get fed the way you're supposed to. You have to give a quota and work that way to get fed. And again, so they're pretty horrible. And then some of them aren't sent to gulags. They're just sent very far to nowhere in Siberia, where they end up going deep into the into the into central Asian parts of the Soviet Union, where life during the war is really difficult, and the various stands like Kazakhstan and other such places. And again, could I have a, the next slide? So this is a postcard from Jewish refugees from Poland who are living, as it says, in the Lavlenka village in Kazakhstan, the Tel Aviv, in 1942. So some of them get to these places. And they somehow managed to survive. But when you read memoirs of people who are in this situation, life is as basic as it can be. And if you get sick, there's really nothing to do. And you're living just half a millimeter above starvation if you're lucky. It's very, very hard there. But again, many of them will survive this particular flight. OK. When the Germans invaded, those areas of the Soviet Union, like the Baltic countries, the more Western parts of it, uh, when the Germans invaded them in the summer of 1941, many, many fled deeper. Again, going to Kazakhstan and other places, um, but roughly a million people remained in Soviet areas and then similar numbers, and then very large numbers in the Baltic states as well, but in the pre-1940 Soviet areas, maybe a million stayed. And, 95% of those were murdered in those places. And the number of Jews murdered in places like Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia is the percentages are also, you know, into those 90% numbers, except for those from Estonia who managed to flee. That was a small community. But so being in those areas, right, it's only a temporary refuge for many of them. I mean, they're going to be overrun later on. And that's a part of that story as well. And of course, while they were fleeing, nobody knew how this persecution would unfold, because it's only in the summer of 1941 that the Nazis begin systematically mass murdering Jews. Could I have the next slide, please? In March of 1942, the final solution now, this policy of the systematic mass murder of Jews is underway. And already by December, the first Jews have been deported to the first camp that had been set up as a place for murder, which was the Helmno camp that was set up in December of 41. And in the spring of 1942, the Nazis began setting up the other extermination centers, as they would call them. I hate that word extermination. It's the word the Nazis use, but you exterminate you know, pests. You don't exterminate people. These are killing centers for Jews, murder centers for the Jews. And they begin to be set up in the autumn of, in the spring of 42 through into the summer where Auschwitz-Birkenau was completed, which will eventually be the largest of all of them. In March of 1942, the Slovak government agreed to deport Slovak Jews east. And they agreed with the Germans and they even paid the carrying charges because the German railways always charged for those who were being taken and the German authorities charged. And so they ended up paying every, for every person to the German government to deport their Jews, the Slovaks. The very first train that left Slovakia in March of 1942 was made of 999 Jewish girls 
age 16 to 18. And the next train was a similar train and then these trains are rolling. When those early trains left, the Zionist youth movement members in Slovakia began asking themselves, what does this mean? Why are they sending out young women, the girls who are members of our youth movement, our sisters, our friends, our cousins, our classmates, why are they sending them to the East? And their conclusion was based on how they understood history. And what they knew was that in World War I, young women had sometimes been taken against their will in order to be in the brothels for the soldiers. And that's what they believed was happening. They said, we can't let this happen. We have to do something about it. And so they decided that they had to try to stop those trains from rolling, further trains from rolling, and they wanted to blow up the railroad tracks. But of course, these are Zionist youth movement kids, right? Young people, they don't have explosives and things. On the other hand, there was a nascent communist underground and they thought maybe from them they could get explosives. And some of the very leftist in the Zionist youth movement had very strong contacts with the communist underground and they spoke to them and they asked for you know, explosives in order to, to blow up the rail tracks and the communist underground leader said to them, we can't give them to you. Not because we don't empathize with what you're saying but because we're planning on having a much bigger kind of uprising and we're just in the beginning, we can't give ourselves away. If they trace it to us, then that'll destroy our plans. And again, the truth is there is a Slovak national uprising that will occur quite a bit later in, uh, in uh, the early autumn of 1944, in which these communist groups are very central to what's going on there. So it's not that they're just saying something to them, but they don't help in the end. So the Zionist Jews leaders turned to another idea, and that was to flee. And so where did they want to flee to? Where did they try to, to foster flight? To their next door neighbor, which was Hungary. Because if the deportations were going apace now in spring of 1942 from Slovakia, in Hungary, there weren't deportations in this period at all. And things were much better. I won't say they were good, but they were much better. Relatively, they were good. And the other thing is that before World War I, Slovakia and Hungary were all part of the Hungarian uh, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire under Hungary. So many Slovak Jews had family members in Hungary. Some of them spoke Hungarian. So it made a lot of sense to try to get them into Hungary. And eventually about 8,000 Jews fled from Slovakia to Hungary. Some of them with help that was organized um, through the Zionist Youth Movement members and then by something we call the Working Group, which is a group of leaders from very different shades of the spectrum of, of uh, Slovak Jewry. Rabbi Michael Beredov Weismandl, who was very, very ultra Orthodox through Gizi Fleischmann, his cousin in marriage, who was the head of women's Zionist organization and others involved in this, right? And they helped fund the flight. They had some money and they managed to give it to, to people because you needed money for things. You needed money, you wanted false papers that cost money. If you wanted to get false papers and just buy a ticket on the train to go to Hungary, which you could, that cost money. If you wanted to be smuggled, that costs money as well. And so that's what the working group was doing with these Zionist youth movement people. Could I have the next slide, please? One of the people most involved in this was uh, a Maccabi Hatzair leader. His name was Peretz Revis. He was a little older than now, and uh, he, I think he was already around 30 at this point, late 20s. And he was involved in trying to help fund this flight. And then the Soviet police, uh, the, the Slovak police discovered what he was doing. And he and his young wife decided they had to flee themselves. And so this is in April of 1942 that he's found out about. So Paris Revis, who knows a lot about this, right? He gets himself outfitted with his wife with false papers. They get in touch with a border smuggler. And then they are taken one night to the border. And he becomes very suspicious of what's happening. And he understands that the smuggler is just leading them nowhere in circles and he's going to just take their money. And Paris Revis is uh, not afraid of this guy and he threatens him physical violence and the guy kind of gives in to them. And so they don't lose all their money and everything else. And he comes back to Bratislava with his wife. And then they manage to find another smuggler, somebody who will take them on a barge down the Danube River between Bratislava and Budapest. And he hides them in the barge under tarps and they manage to get there and then once he gets to Budapest, he meets um, Zionist leaders, uh, the people from the Relief, Budapest Relief and Rescue Committee, some names which you may know, like um, Israel Kostner is involved in this, Otto Komoy, Joel Brand, and others. And Parents Revis becomes part of that group. He functions as the Zionist youth representative on it. He 
more or less is Costner's secretary some of the time. And he becomes involved in helping Jews who managed to get from Slovakia find a way to live in Hungary. Why? Because these are illegal refugees too. And in Hungary in 1942 or 43, you need papers. You need papers to show, um, to show the watchmen of the apartment building. So it'll let you live there. You need papers because things are rationed. You have to get ration cards. You have to have papers that show you are because you can be stopped in the police. There's an alien police that's working. And if you don't have the right documentation, again, you can be deported back to where you came from. So Paris Rebbe's and the Zionist Jews movement people are very involved in trying to get papers for people, forged papers, stolen papers, bought papers, whatever they can get so that people are supplied. So even if you manage to flee across the border, right? there's not a small chance that you will be sent back because you're caught in some way. And Peretz himself at one point was caught and then managed to get back into Hungary. So it's not a simple thing that's going on here at all, even for those that flee. And again, this is during the war. And it's during the time when Slovak Jews are being deported. And then after there's a break in that deportation for a while, but there's deportations. It doesn't mean that the people like Peretz Rebbe's in this early period know what deportations are all about. They do know early on that deportations mean a lot of suffering and even death. They don't know for quite a while yet about camps that are being set up for the murder of the Jews. That's going to come a little bit later. So the flight's coming a little early in their understanding, even though if we look at the picture, we're already deep into the period of the murder. OK, could I have another slide now? There's other places people are trying to, to escape to as well, especially the neutral countries of Europe. Um, of course, when we think about it first, we always think about Switzerland, which is you know this island in the middle and uh, where you can go from France or from Germany or from Italy, you can get, get to Switzerland. They're all bordered with Switzerland. Um, and so Switzerland is the neutral we think of. There's also Spain and Portugal, Sweden, of course, Turkey is neutral in this period. None of them have open door policies as we know. And a lot's been written about you know, how the Swiss were turning back groups and and how hard it was, for example, to get into Switzerland. The man in this picture is Walter Benjamin, who's um, very well known in intellectual history, we would say. He was in Germany before he fled under the Nazis already when they came to power in 1933, he fled to France to begin with. He was one of the leading intellectuals. He was a, a critic, a literary critic, but he was a real philosopher in the way he wrote. And he was a very well-respected person. And even today, I mean, his books, his writings are, are still studied today uh, by many people. So he was in France, he fled, 1933. He fled to France, like not a few intellectuals did. And he was in France, but what happened in the summer of 19, in the spring of 1940, the Nazis invaded Western Europe and then France fell in June of 1940. And so in the autumn of 1940, after the fall of France, he tried to flee again to another neutral country, the one that he tried to go to was Spain, which meant getting to the Pyrenees, right, to the mountains, and then getting across the mountains. And there were smugglers and people who helped Jews doing this, you know, try to get across the mountain. So he was not a well man by this point. He had a heart condition. And he managed with a group of people to get to the foot of the Pyrenee Mountains at a place called Banul Sumer. Um, and then they managed to get to a port called, called Bau um, on the foothills of the Pyrenees. But in order to go into Spain, you needed a visa from the Spanish, which he actually had. But you also needed an exit visa from the French, which he didn't have. And so he became desperate in his mind that he wasn't going to be allowed in because he didn't have the right papers. And so on September 26, 1940, when he was just a hair's breadth from going into Spain, Walter Benjamin committed suicide. He was only 48. There are others that are trying to help Jews flee, also often over the Pyrenees so that we get to Spain and then maybe from there to Portugal as well. There was a group of, um, of Jews and non-Jews in the Netherlands that were deeply involved in this. And of course, the Netherlands also fell in the spring of 1940. And there was a woman named Miriam Pinkoff who was at, working at a Jewish school that was located on her family's farm, a Jewish woman. And she became friendly with a teacher and educator nearby by the name of uh, Joop Westerville. 
And they decided together with a few other people, one of them was Joachim Simon, who was named Shushu, to organize something to help protect refugee German children who had come to the Netherlands and then also Dutch children as well as things progressed and to help to protect them and to keep them. And this group came to be known after Joop, so it was called the, the, the Vesterville group. And again, they tried to hide children who were living uh, with them in a Zionist youth home and they ended up succeeding in rescuing a great many of them. In addition to trying to hide children in the Netherlands and place them with people who could take care of them, they also tried to get them out of Dutch territory. And it, what they did was they brought them to France and then from France again, tried to get them over the Pyrenees. And they, they made contacts with smugglers and others and they managed to begin to do this and they had a certain amount of success. Um, eventually they managed to get about 200 Jews, mostly children, but not only uh, to reach France. And then for them, 70 of them managed to get to Spain. They also managed to free some Jews from one of the internment camps uh, in the Netherlands, which is called Folkt. Um, they managed to do that as well with forged documents and other things. In January of 1943, however, one of the main people, Shushu, um, Joachim Simon, was arrested on the Dutch-Belgian border. And then he was in prison and he committed suicide in prison lest uh, he be tortured and give up the group and what he was doing. On March 11, 1944, Joop Vesterville and another co-worker by the name of Buka Koenig were also caught at the Belgian border, again, trying to smuggle Jews, uh, trying to bring, uh, to have the route working to bring Jews from the Netherlands through Belgium into France and then into Spain. And so he too was arrested. He was put in this camp, folk camp, and he was tortured and he was executed on August 11th, 1944. He was shot by firing squad. His wife also was arrested. Um, she was part of this, but she survived, but she was forced to witness her husband's execution. Um, and she ended up in the Ravensbrück camp. New Festerville and the non-Jews in that group were all designated righteous among the nations. And in all told, it seems they might have saved about 300 Jews, many of them, again, by fleeing from the Netherlands into France, and then some of them further into, into uh, Spain. Another place that people are fleeing, of course, is to Sweden, and that's one of the most famous ones. It's not that everybody can flee to Sweden. It's very hard to go to Sweden. Sweden is not interested in having refugees until the big turnabout in the war at Stalingrad in early 1943, where the Germans are losing, Swedish neutrality, which has been more pro-German, is becoming more pro-Western ally, right? And so um, there's going to be more of an opportunity. Denmark was the country from which this large number of Jews managed to reach Sweden in the autumn of 1943. And of course, it has a very specific context what's going on here. Denmark has, first of all, a small Jewish community. So that's important. There's only 8,000 Jews. It's not like the city of Warsaw, right, that has 440,000 Jews in the ghetto at its height. This is a small community. Also, the nature of the Nazi regime in Denmark was not heavy-handed until summer of 43, it became more heavy-handed. It actually gave Denmark a lot of leeway. It had its own parliament until the spring of 1943 functioning because the Nazis saw the Danes as their racial kin. They wanted to convince them to, to join them. And so they were not using a really strong hand in Denmark as part of it. So democracy is an idea never fully died in, in Denmark. And by the, 1943, there began to be much more um, much more activity against the Nazi regime. One of the results of that was that the Werner Best, who was the responsible, the most responsible person for of Nazi Germany in Denmark, thought maybe it was time finally to deport the Jews and they began working on it. But then he sort of got cold feet because he began to believe that deporting the Jews might make it even worse to work with the Danes. And, and so he let this be leaked out to one of the people he worked with, a man named George Duck, Duckwitz. And just before the deportations were to begin in the autumn of 43, the news leaked out. And so the Danish underground organized along with Jewish leaders. It's not just the Danish underground, the Jewish leaders are involved as well, in order to facilitate rescue. And, and the Swedes had already declared just a few months earlier that anybody who can flee Denmark, Jews for Sweden would be allowed in. So that's a very important thing that makes it a possibility. And the Danish underground, along with just lots of 
Danes who are not necessarily in the underground and Jews working together, they managed to bring Jews to the ports and put them on fishing boats and send them to Denmark. Of course, the fishermen were often paid, sometimes a lot of money to bring the Jews, sometimes they didn't get paid. It's a mixed bag. It's not all fully altruist, altruistic what's happening, but even those that are being paid are certainly risking their, their lives and their property by doing it or so they think. The Germans in the end didn't really interfere with this flotilla because again, Best had his cold feet and others around them and they, they didn't interfere. And so the Jews left. Out of the 8,000 Jews in Denmark, about 7,200 managed to get to Switzerland. So this is the biggest single rescue of a country group of Jews, I mean, in terms of percentage that we can talk about, even if the numbers aren't that great. And it's a very important piece of the story that we tell. So this is, a, this is also a rescue in a flight that happens, but it's not a flight that just Jews fly, fleeing on their own, of course. There's a lot of help given here, but it's also because there's somewhere to flee to and there's an opportunity to do it. So it's very different if you go back and even think about what Morris Vishgarod's talking about his family, that they didn't know where to go. They didn't think they could go anywhere. They were afraid of going to the Soviet Union, right? Because of what they knew about the Soviets even. Here, this is very different. This is fleeing to Sweden, which again, is everybody who flees there will understand that, that it really will be a place of refuge. So there's these different things happening, right? It's not just a question of whether you want the flea, there's also what are the opportunities? How does it work? And what are the possibilities? And what do you understand about your situation and where you're going? All of these things are factors in, the, in before the war and after the war. So you can ask yourself the question, what's needed to flee before the war? Well, you need a place to go, right? A country willing to take you in. You need connections often. If you have connections, it's easier. I mean, it was easier for somebody like Albert Einstein to flee who had connections, who was wanted, for Sigmund Freud, for example. It was easier for them because of who they were. Connections help. You need money. Money is important to go somewhere. You need tremendous patience. You saw that whole list of things you need in order to leave. You need a lot of patience in order to go too. And again, you need to be in the right place at the right time. That's always a part of it, about just the coordination of it all. And what do you need? If it's during the war, in addition to that, again, you have to assess your situation and your options, what you know or what you think you know, and then do what you think you can possibly do. That's all within a certain fog of information. You don't have all the information, no matter what. You might misinterpret what's going on, like the Jewish youth movement members in Slovakia misinterpreted what the deportation was about, but they knew it was dangerous. That was enough for them, I suppose, in the end to spur them to, to, to foster flight. But it's always a problem to understand because this is an unprecedented um, event, this Holocaust, and the information coming through is never full and it's very difficult. Um, and of course, you need a, a destination to go to, as I said, where things will be okay for you. I mean, as we said, in Soviet territory, you might flee but you might be overrun later on. You might be sent to a gulag. You don't know what's going to happen when you flee there. In the summer of 1944, and even before, after the Battle of Stalingrad in, uh, in April of nine, that ended in uh, February of 1943, Hungarian Jewish forced laborers who were with the Hungarian army in the Eastern Front, some of them decided to stay behind and be taken by the Soviets in the sense to flee, right? They didn't flee that they were running somewhere. They stayed behind to be overtaken. So that's a different kind of flight. And the belief that the Soviets would understand that they were persecuted Jews, would take them in, treat them well, give them an opportunity perhaps to fight against those that were persecuting them. Similar things in the summer of 1944 as well were happening of the, for these uh, forced laborers. But the Soviets treated them like Hungarian soldiers because they had been attached to the Hungarian army as forced laborers. And they didn't recognize they were persecuted. And many of them were treated just like the Soviet, the, just like the POWs that were falling into the Soviets' hands in tremendous numbers after Stalingrad, which meant that they were starving to death and freezing to death because nothing was given to those people. The Soviets were so disorganized about it all. Those who survived such things and sometimes did survive, and often they were treated by Jewish doctors and nurses or a Jewish officer they encountered, and then they could sometimes explain themselves that things were better, but just surviving that first hump was hard. So they were left behind. They had a certain expectation about what would happen if they allowed themselves to be taken, but that's not what happened to them at all. So again, you have to know that. 
fleeing into Hungary. Well, Hungary, when you fled from Slovakia into Hungary in 1942, the situation was better than Slovakia, but it was still dangerous because you have, were living illegally or semi-legally. And then the final solution would catch up with them in uh, October, in uh, March of 1944, when the Germans took over Hungary, which was their ally. And then along with the Hungarians organized massive deportations uh, to Auschwitz in the spring of 1944 and then other things they were doing in the persecution. So it overtook them there as well for many of them. If you tried to go to Switzerland, again, you could often be turned back and Walter Benjamin in Sweden, I mean, and trying to go to Spain, the same thing, how hard it is to cross over. So all of these are things that we wanna understand about what you need in order to flee and the, and the issue of luck and also a certain amount of chutzpah sometimes help too when you were crossing borders and trying to go places. But there were so many things here. It was so far from guaranteed that even if you decided to flee, that you might do so successfully. I want to end with a story. And this story is a little counterintuitive, I suppose. And it comes from the book, uh, The Gates of Tears, written by my good friend, Dr. David Silverclay. And he writes about a labor camp by the name of Yanishov. And in November of 1942, 18 partisans stormed the camp and they freed 600 prisoners. So here you have, they're being freed, right? They're liberated. They said they would only take some with them and they ended up taking 10 or 15 with them to be partisans with them. And the others were saying, well, what do we do? So a large group of them decided to leave the camp and flee into the countryside. Um, and 160 decided to remain behind in the camp. Those who fled, almost all of them were caught. We don't know of any of the survivors of any of those who were fled. So that means out of 600 Jews, if 150 or 160 fled, uh, um, if all 160 stayed behind, right? 15 went with the, with the partisans, you can do the arithmetic, right? How many stayed behind? Uh, about 400 and something Jews, uh, I mean, how many fled? About 400 and something Jews fled. And none of them we know, we don't have any of them that survived. Who survived? The ones who stayed behind. The ones who stayed behind reported what happened to the next camp over, which was really the bigger camp in charge of them. And some of them survived, not all of them, but some of them. So that's counterintuitive because you think flight is going to lead to survival, but not necessarily. Um, Labor, forced labor was often a very deadly thing under the Nazis, but it did sometimes provide what could be called a very tenuous, very thin rope or ladder towards survivor, survival, it did do that sometimes. So we think about it, why didn't more flee, right? Why didn't more flee? Well, there's a lot of reasons why more don't flee. Many do flee. Sometimes flight isn't the answer to bringing people towards survival. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, um, I think we do have time for one or two questions. Um, I would really appreciate it if you can shed some light on li the life of Jews who immigrated to Britain, in particular London. Which were the areas they lived in? Did they integrate into the society? Or were they outsiders in London? What did they do for a living? Did the British government help them in settling in and earning a living after migration? Were British sympathetic to them? Or did they face anti-Semitism in the UK as well? From what I know, um, the Jews who fled to Great Britain were supported by the Jewish organizations until the Jewish organization more or less ran out of money. And then the government began supporting the uh, Jews who were there as well. Um, I don't know enough about what initiatives were actually carried out to help people get work, but there was some support going on, especially the, the British retracted from this policy of the aliens and deporting aliens after a while. So many of the younger men ended up joining the British Armed Forces, of course, and became involved in that. Um, but one of the things that they could always find work and that we talk about it already even earlier on, um, works like domestic, to be domestics and things like that were things that people can make a living in. But there's a wide variety of people. And, and the truth is I, I, I'd have to look more deeply into it to give you a better answer. But um, I do know that the original idea and what they were doing for the longest time is that the Jewish organizations were supporting people. That's how, that's how they did it at first, at least. There's a request for you to repeat the name of uh, David Silverclang's book, please. Yeah, it's called Gates of Tears. 
Okay. It's got a uh, longer title, but the main title is called Gates of Tears. And it's a very hard book to read because it's full of very difficult things, but it's a very important book about what happened in Lublin area and the whole district during the Holocaust. So if you have the energy, I would suggest, and you're interested, it's really worth reading. So um, in the interest of time, I think we are going to have to end here. And um, Joel, if you just put up that last slide, please. Um, uh, Rob, we just want to thank you very, very much for a fascinating lecture. And I think I'm speaking on behalf of everyone here. Um, uh, um, the, the compliments um, to you in the chat are quite extensive. Um, the um, participation of people from all over the world is very interesting. We, we even have someone from Mauritius. Um, and we really just want to thank you, um, someone from Croatia, um, a lot of compliments. And it, it's a fascinating topic. And it's such an easy thing to say, well, why didn't they leave? And, and you've certainly opened up our eyes to, to a lot of the um, very objective reasons um, why people didn't leave and how difficult it really was for anyone to leave. Um, so thank you. And everyone, we thank you for joining us. And we look forward to having you join us in future lectures as well. If there are lectures which you miss um, and you'd like to watch them or listen to them, um, they will be available on uh, the Yad Vashem YouTube site. Once again, thank you for joining us, Rob. Thanks for a fascinating and very informative lecture. And I wish you all the very best. Bye-bye now.